Hello, welcome to class time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson in real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or on onespotmedia.com. We are also live on gojamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subjects, you can send them into Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. We want to see those questions. Today's lesson is CSEC Theatre Arts and I'm Hope Bloomfield. And I am Vanessa Gardner. Yeah, run go wash the chest up. Catch up the fire, Fred. Tell Lou to send some seasoning gum. It's Mary Turkey dead. The turkey wake up hearty and was strolling about the place. When the man cater a starving dog, just buck up face to face. The turkey stop, the dog draw drop, and him out and work it. And make a big ramba bamba dive. I bounce down the turkey. Poor Miss Mary, she a ball out. Why? Who not save the turkey? Kill the dog! Poor soul. Two men ran out to help her. But by that time, the turkey cool. Poor Miss Mary, she a groan and a sigh. Miss Weir had to stop reads. She take what say. When the turkey cook, she wouldn't touch the meat. <laughs> My mouth starts sympathize with her. And tell her say she right. But here for me tender heart say. For me belly I go bust tonight. So run go beg Jim to steal bread. And find some coconut oil. I beg you talk loud met grudgeful Emma yeah. So we are going to eat in style. Them say. When ass dead. Cow fat. When puss laugh. Fear tree fall. But for me belly I go bust tonight. Meanwhile Miss Mary she a ball. <laughs> You have just heard Rose Turkey, a story written in the form of poetry by actress, performer, writer, storyteller extraordinaire, Louise Bennett Coverley. And with that, we will be introducing our topic today, storytelling in the Caribbean. When you think of storytelling, what comes to mind? Yes, Natasha? Oral tradition, very good. What else? Live interaction, yes! Yes, you are correct. So, by the end of this lesson, you will be able to state the main functions of storytelling, understand the theatrical elements or techniques used in performing stories, highlight common features of Anansi stories, develop an appreciation for Anansi stories, and, and demonstrate, demonstrate how storytelling can be used in performance. So, what is storytelling? Storytelling is an art. It is an art that uses vivid words, gestures, movement or images to interpret and give a detailed report of factual and fictional events or experiences to an audience. The vehicle or the fuel behind a story is the storyteller. And with that job comes several responsibilities. It is the storyteller responsibility to interpret and report the story. They should also interact and connect with the audience. Most important, they should simplify and provide perspective. And while doing that, they are teaching you and reinforcing values. So, we tell stories for many reasons. But three main reasons for telling stories are to entertain, to understand your world, and to teach morals or cultural values. There are many types of stories in the Caribbean. We have Anansi stories, 
And please make note of the different spelling of Anansi. We can end it with the S-E, the S-I. Different territories spell it different ways. We also have doppy stories, ghost stories, or in some territories, they call them jumbi stories. And we also have folklore stories that teach you about the culture. So, do you know any folklore? What was that? It's because I hear Miss Bloomfield talk about it. And it's a story. All right. So Miss Bloomfield is going to share an Anansi story with you. Who no ever hear or wonder why crab have one tough shell pan him back? Hmm. I bet you could never tell me. But I have the explanation for you this morning. Mm -hmm. One time, there was a woman called Mada Cantini. What me say she name? Mother Cantini. Yes. And this woman was a rich old woman. And she never had no children. Not only she did rich, never have children, but she was also a very wicked woman. Yes. And since she never had no children, she used to adopt the animals them in the community. They were her children. So she had a fowl, duck, goat, Crab, all sort of animal. And she make sure she tell them, say, do not tell anybody me name. And so the children listened to her. But that was only study reaction. Because Mother Cantini have this habit, she hired the young girls in the district. And when she hired them young girls, she tell them that after them days work, the only way them go and get them peer is if them could tell her our name. So, it was a time like now, coming on to Christmas time. And Nancy hear about Mother Cantini and him want to make some money. So him decide that him going to do some day's work for Mother Cantini. And although him don't know her name, by the end of the day, him should find out. So, and Nancy go, and Mother Cantini tell him what to do to the day. Now, them days, it wasn't like these days when we have nice pipe and shower in the house. No, no. So you have to go to the spring to wash your clothes. So a hard work Anansi have to do. So Anansi take the pan of clothes and him go down by the spring and him start to wash. And him wash and wash and wash and while him there, him wondering, how will I get to know this lady name? Lo and behold, one of Mother Cantini children start to walk past the crab. So when him start to walk past, and Nancy, disguised as a woman, decides say, she going to start a conversation with him. Here are. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> How you doing? So Crab now never have a woman talk to him before like that, you know. So him say, <laughs> all right, still you know. <laughs> so Anansi say, boy, you look nice. So Crab look pan him and say, <laughs> go on, man, you know for go on them way there. But there's a girl with sense, do you know? Yeah, man. So Anansi say to him, say, you look like you travel. You go on foreign? So hear him. No. So then, and Nancy decide to frame him up with the conversation. By the end of the conversation, Frog was swept off him feet. Him go tell and Nancy say, him will give him anything in promise. So hear Anansi now. <laughs> Remember him a hack like girl, you know. So Anansi say, all right. I will listen to your promise. Remember, you know anything. So Crab go about him ways. And Anansi wash the clothes, but when Crab was passing back, when Crab was passing back, Anansi said to Crab, Um, you know, say me done the day's work. And me go up to the old lady. And she said she not pay me. Come in on her name. 
So crab no, cause an anti the sweep him off him feet, decide say, him going to tell her the name of the old woman. So crab say, no worry yourself, man. Am I mother that you know? Let me tell you what she name. Come, let me whisper in your ears. She name Mother Cantini. Me say, and Nancy never even wait for tell crab thanks. He me run go up at the old lady house and ask for him money same time. So the lady say, no, what me name? So Anansi say, um, your name, Mother Sue? She say, no. So Anansi say, um, your name, Mother Rachel, the old lady said. No. So her Nancy bust it upon her same time and said, Ah! Oh, your new mother can't The lady was so shocked. She just took out the money same time and threw it give her Nancy. And Nancy take the money and gone. So she decided that she going to call all of her children because it's most one of them tell Anansi her name. And she line up all of them in front of her. And she say, The girl will come work for me today. Could tell me my name. And she tell me say, I am Mother Cantini. And so everybody hold on them head because I trouble them in a now, you know. So she say, I am Cantini. I am Mother Cantini. You ain't Cantini. So tell me which one of who no tell me name. And me dear, when she asks them and she walk from left to right, all of them tell her say is not them. All of them except who? Brother Crab. Yes, Brother Crab. And Brother Crab hold on him head. And when she sees a Brother Crab hold on him head, she knows say it's him. And she says, Is you tell her my name? And she take one calabash where she have. And she take it and lick Crab on him back. And when she lick Crab on him back, she lick him so hard. Piece of the calabash each up on Crab back. And from that day till now, Crab have a hard shell pan him back. Eh? Uh -huh. Is a Nancy make it? Jack Mandora? Me no choose none. Wow. And Nancy and Crab. Which Nancy story you know? A Nancy and Fire? A Nancy and Bro Tukuma? Which other one? I didn't hear that. Oh, and, but that's the same thing as an Nancy and Fire. Did you listen to that story, Crab and Brother and Nancy? And Nancy. And what were some of the features that were mentioned? What are some of the things um, why you would say that an Nancy story was important then and it is still relevant now? So, we'll find out this and more after the break. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
Welcome back. This is CSEC Theatre Arts. We're discussing storytelling in the Caribbean. And before the break, we looked at an Anansi story. What was the name of that story? Yes, Anansi and Crab. Did you listen carefully to the story? Now, when you think of an image of Anansi, what comes to mind? A spider and a man. And you're right on it. Now we're going to be looking at the legend. Anansi. So, Anansi, or Anansi stories, were brought by our West African ancestors. And they talk mainly of the ventures of a Spider-Man tr trickster hero called Anansi. He's often portrayed with a lisp and a falsetto. Other traditional characters are his wife, Kruki, and his son, Tukuma. Caribbean stories involving animal heroes like Anansi, because we have other stories like with bread of rabbit or bread of tortoise or bread of Tukuma, all the different types of animals. We refer to these stories as Anansiism, or in a simpler term, spider tales. Anansi stories are very important to people in the Caribbean, not just our West African ancestors. And during the time of slavery, Anansi stories had many functions. Anansi, the character, the hero, represented a spirit of resilience and rebellion. That's the reason for him being the trickster in so many of the stories, because it taught the slaves how they themselves could find innovative ways to trick and triumph over their oppressors. Anansi stories also gave solace and encouragement to our slave ancestors. And because of all these things, we will find that in different Anansi stories, the characters have important meanings and functions, not just in the story, but to our real lives. Then, after emancipation, Anansi stories still had an important function in our lives, in our heritage. It is used for entertainment mainly, but it's also used to help, it represents ways in which we, the weak or disadvantaged individuals, can scheme and triumph over whatever oppressors we may have. So we find different ways to solve our conflicts. So back in slavery, we could look to Anansi to be that innovator in overcoming problems, and even today, we can do the same. Yes, and earlier on when Miss Bloomfield did this story, I asked that you tell me some of the features that were mentioned. So when it comes to Nancy stories or Anansi stories, we know that some of these features include, they usually start with a question or a riddle. And you remember Miss Bloomfield started off that story? What was the question? You ever wonder why crab have the big tough something on him back? It's an Anansi cause it, you know. That same Anansi. Another feature is that Creole is often used to communicate the events in the story. So the Creole used in the different Caribbean territories were often the language that was used in Anansi stories. Anansi stories also explain cultural norms and rituals. And they usually end with a disclaimer or like Jack Mandora, me no choose none. You also have a Anansi make it. Mm -hmm. Or in St. Lucia, you might hear them say, me step on the wire and the wire bend. And, and that's, that's the, the way, way the story, story ends. End. Now, this disclaimer is important because the storyteller is separating him or herself from the action of Anansi and saying to Jack Mandora, 
who is the keeper of heaven, I am not in agreement with the tricks of Anansi, and I am not in disagreement. I am just giving the story as it was told. So me get it, so me sell it. Now, in performing Anansi stories, there are certain techniques that we need to use. What were some of the techniques you noticed in Miss Bloomfield's presentation? Yes, yeah, she was acting. What was that, Davia? She tried singing. She sing, man. So she was singing. All right. So yes, so we have acting, singing, and playing of instruments, movement and dance, audience participation, vocalization, and animation. So let us look at the acting. So with the acting, you may find your storyteller taking on different roles of the characters so that it is easier for you to understand and see the mannerisms or get the personality of the character in the story. Yes, and when we're acting, please, especially when it comes to storytelling, don't depend solely on the props. Don't depend solely, don't bother go with a lot of costume. See, so you realize Miss Bloomfield, she was reenacting. She, she mentioned Aunt Nancy, Mother Cantini, Brother Crab. But what she did, she used animation. You remember how oh, Nancy talk? With a lisp or a falsetto voice. Yes. We also had singing and instruments, so songs and music are usually included in Anansi stories. And a lot of the folk songs that we know today were actually introduced in Anansi stories. Yes. Because these help to add atmosphere and dramatic effect. <laughs> Right. Have you ever heard the song that said, Right through, right through the rocky road, sing Charlie Molly call you. Right through, right through the rocky road, sing Charlie Molly call and you. And even the story that Miss Bloomfield did yesterday, she sang a song. What is song again, Miss Bloomfield? Them said that me da cantini. Them said that me da old woman prim. Me da prim. You da prim? Cantini me buona prim prim. I you say continue, and this, like she says, helps to add dramatic effect to the performance. And it is important that the storyteller familiarize him or herself with the lyrics of the song, because a lot of times the lyrics in the song help to reinform the, reinforce the themes or the messages. And also audience participation and engagement. Yes. There's also movement and dance. Okay, and dance. So, <laughs> gestures and other aspects of movement. So yes, dancers, you can tell your story even though you're not using words because you can use different types of movement to um, depict characters, to establish setting and different elements in a story. So you are asked to um, Create image, be creative, create your characters with your movement and dance, and that helps to make your story more animated. Audience participation. Now think of it. So I am here telling you a story, and you just sit down and I look for me so. No, man. And so, as the storyteller, it's imperative that we get the audience involved. And sometimes when telling story, sometimes the storyteller says, When me say crick, you say crack. Crick, crack. Very good. And that gets the audience involved. And like we mentioned, sometimes the, 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 the storyteller says, All right, sing with me. Them say that me da continue, yes. So you elicit audience participation. So storytelling, because when we started early and we ask what word comes to mind when you talk about storytelling, somebody says interaction. And so storytelling um, is an interactive performance art form and it requires direct interaction between the teller and the audience. And other techniques for audience participation, you have the call and response. You can start with a riddle to get the audience in a light spirit or with jokes 
and you must include your improvisation. So don't be afraid sometimes to jump in and out of role just to see if your audience is going along with you. Vocalization and animation, another important element. So the voice and the body are very important tools when it comes to communicating your story. So we have to think of how will we animate the voice to get the audience engaged. So you have to think of how will I play with the pitch? How will I play with pace and the pause and the textures and the tones to get the audience engaged and interested in what I am saying? So you will have to experiment as the storyteller with different ways in which you can use the voice to get them into what you are saying. Yes, the dynamics of pitch, pace, pause, textures, and tones in the voice are useful because this adds suspense mm -hmm. and intrigue to evoke emotions. It also helps to capture the essence of the different characters. And here we'll introduce you to some of our Jamaican storytellers. There are many of them, but these are just a few. We have here Dr. Louise Bennett Coverley, who wore many hats, all of them did. Uh, we also have Amina Blackwood Meeks, Dr. Amina Blackwood Meeks, and Dr. Joan Andrea Hutchinson. Very um, multifaceted storytellers. Yes, and also we have storytellers in other Caribbean countries such as, oh Lord, let me go back to it. We have Ken Corsby in Guyana. Yes, Paul Keynes Douglas in Trinidad. We have Alfred Pragnell in Barbados. And George Fish Alfonso of St. Lucia. You can do your own research on these theater person, sorry, these storytellers, because you know CXC will be asking you about different territory. Okay, so sto a story can be told in many ways or using many different things. A play, for example, is a way of telling a story on the stage. But there are so many other things we can use, like poetry, as Miss Gardner demonstrated at the start of our lesson. We can also tell stories using songs. YouTubers or vloggers are also storytellers in their own right. We can see stories in news clippings and social media platforms are also good mediums for storytelling. So let us look at the YouTubers and vloggers. So in this pandemic, we have a lot of persons who have turned to social media. And there are stars. One such we have here on, on screen is Meet the, the, the Mitchells with Tammy Mitchell and Wayne Mitchell. Lord. All right. And then we also, we are going to be looking at poetry like Miss Bloomfield mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and also news clippings. So let us see if we can go to our news clippings. All right, so social media platform is here. So we have Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Tik, all of them. People use pictures, people use posts to tell their own stories. So status, you, this is a big thing now, you know, Miss. Yes. Everybody put up status. So in your status, you are also telling a story. And like we said, news clips. So just listen to this news clip and see how a story was told. 
Crowning the dramatic rescue of a 12-year-old boy from a gully in Trenchtown, St. Andrew. The case has made national headlines because of the man now being hailed as a hero who jumped into the gully to save the teen. As it turns out, the man needed rescuing himself, so it's a tale of two heroes, not one. And as it also turns out, this is not the first time a child has been swept, swept away in that gully. TVJ Shamela Mitchell has this primetime news follow-up. <laughs> It's the video that has gone viral on social media. A man holding a child, the two of them being swept away by raging waters in a gully. Meet Tremaine Brown, a man the community of Trenchdown St. Andrew is now hailing as a hero. He saw 12-year-old Ronaldo Reynolds washing away and rushed to help. Just natural instinct. It's a natural instinct. I didn't feel or think anything. When I see him, my instinct was just to help him. So he jumped into the gully to try to save the little boy who was headed home from school last Friday as it rained heavily and unwisely decided to dip his toes into the waters of the local gully. Which brings us back to this scene. Karine Duggan, the mother of the 12-year-old, was headed home when she heard the news. By that time, not only was her son washing away, but also the man who tried to help. Then came Alfonso Coombs. He was on his way from work and heard the commotion. I'm going to reach way, way around to Marcus Gabby Drive Roadside. He said, I'm going to cross the canal there. So I'm going to see him call me. I'm going to see him see like them head down, down to the water. He said, I'm going to see like him foot stay so up. Because I'm going to call him and I'm like, hey! And he start drink beer water, beer water start going down in him. So I'm just make a mad chuck off. But and... Thank you for that clip. And an example of how stories can be used in song is, can be shown in Loving Dear's song entitled Wild Gilbert when he spoke about the happenings of Hurricane Gilbert in, in the year 1988. 1988. View this clip. <laughs> All right, let us look at this clip. No, we can't touch the midish, the midish. And interestingly, we can use Anansi stories to talk about all of these things. Now, let us look at some multiple choice questions that you might see or might come on your written paper at the end of your studies. So which of the following is not an attribute of storytelling? Is it A, they amuse, entertain, inspire and stimulate readers? Is it B, they use novelistic elements to dramatize the story themes? Story themes, sorry. Or C, they're written to a single formula. Or better yet, it is D. They usually are less timely than straight news stories. Remember now, look at the operative word, not. So which is the correct response? D. Very good. Another question could be, renowned storyteller Paul Keynes Douglas is from A. Guyana, B. St. Lucia, C. Jamaica, or D. Trinidad. If you said the answer is D, you are correct. Another possible question. Who is Jack Mandora? Is he Anansi's father? Or better yet, he's the keeper of heaven. Or he's an African god. Jack Mandora is Anansi himself, I can't bet you. What's your response? If you chose be the keeper of heaven, that is correct. Anansi stories usually end with A, a question, B, a disclaimer, C, a summary, or D, some details that evokes the lead. Hmm. B, is it a disclaimer? That is correct.
Which of the following is not a feature of Anansi stories? Is it Creole is often used to communicate the events? B, it usually ends with a question. C, it explains cultural norms and rituals. Or D, it ends with a disclaimer. So uh, which of the following is not a feature? B. It's not B. It is not a feature. You are correct. <laughs> Which of the following least describes the elements of a performed story? Is it A, suspense, summary and anecdote? B, singing, acting, vocalization? C, movement, dance, vocal and physical imagery? Or D, call and response? audience participation and morals. Pay attention to the word least. And our references are displayed on the board. <laughs> so I know that you are now able to write or list features of Anansi's story. Now, if you have any questions on what we have done today, send them to our various platforms and we'll answer them for you. Until next time, I'm, I'm Hope Bloomfield and I am Vanessa Gardner. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome back to Class Time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. Today, we'll be discussing English literature, and we'll pick up where we left off last week with thematic development in short stories. I'm Vanessa Francis. So as I said, we're continuing with what we started with last week. We were looking at thematic development and how it comes across in different stories. So these are our objectives for today. So of course, you should be able to review the main points from the previous lesson, because we'll need to remember those for today's lesson. You also need to identify themes in selected stories, and you will discuss thematic development in selected stories. So the stories we're focusing on today will be Mom Luby and the Social Worker by Kristin Hunter, The Day the World Almost Came to an End, by Curl, Pearl Creighton, sorry, and Blackout by Roger Mays. But before we get into that, remember, we're going to recap last week's lesson. So we talked about thematic development. We looked at various ways that writers use to bring thematic development across. So they can use characters, and the characters through their qualities, through their actions, through how they respond to certain situations. You look at character development and how that will bring across a theme. So the way the characters grow and change, the lessons they learn. You look at relationships. So the qualities that the novel shows that 
show good relationships and we did say you could look at how bad relationships can also bring out a theme. We looked at dialogue and inner character thoughts. So what they say to each other, what they say about each other, the thoughts they have. Then we looked at the plot, the different key events. So those can bring out the theme as well. The conflict can bring out the theme, how it is resolved and the structure of the plot in the sense that how it starts and how it, how it ends might be a nice contrast there. So that might bring out the theme. You look at the setting. The setting can bring out the theme depending on what you're reading. The setting might be important. So we looked at some stories where the setting played an integral part in thematic development. And symbolism can also play a part. So with these stories today, we're going to look at something similar. We're going to see what aspects bring out thematic development. So here's the table that we're going to use as a guide. So notice you have the story, of course, the name of the story at the top, so you'd fill that in. Then you'd write which theme you're looking at. So we're going story by story, theme by theme this time. And for the theme, you look at, was it characters who brought it out? Was it character development that brought it out? Did relationships bring it out? Did dialogue or internal monologue or thoughts bring it out? Did the plot in respect of the conflict bring it out? Did the plot structure bring it out? Did setting bring it out? Or did symbolism bring it out? So our first story, of course, Mom Luby and the Social Worker. Of course, we have to do a little summary first. So you need to get an idea of what's happening in the story. So, of course, if you remember, Mom Luby is written by Elijah, written from the perspective of Elijah, sorry. <laughs> And he's a 13-year-old boy, and he and his five-year-old sister have been adopted informally by Mom Luby, meaning she has just decided to take care of them. She didn't do the paperwork to say, I'm their legal guardian or anything like that. But through the goodness of her own heart, she has taken care of them because their mother has passed away. We have not heard anything about them having a father. We don't know his story. So... Mom Luby herself is not formally employed and she doesn't earn a stable income. And because of this, she applies for government aid, state aid for the children. So if you think about in our Jamaican situation, it would be something similar to a PATH program that she is applying for. Now, Miss Rushmore, who is a social worker, she arrives in order to investigate the situation because, of course, they want to get to the bottom of things, want to know the truth. However, she does not come there with the best of intentions necessarily. So she's highly critical of Mom Luby's lifestyle initially, but through her interactions, she ends up garnering some amount of respect for her, even kind of grudgingly, but she does end up respecting her. So Mom Luby decides not to pursue the state aid because after Miss Rushmore tells her all the different hoops they have to jump through, all the different rigmarole and all of that, she says, you know what? We can do without it. We will survive. So here are the major themes that we will look at in that story. So survival, it is a story of survival. Now, the aspects that bring out survival, we look at characters. So Mom Luby, in order to survive, she's involved in several occupations to provide for her family. If you think again of the Jamaican situation, you'd, you'd call her a hustler. So she is out there doing various things to get money to take care of her, the children, and actually her extended family, the people who rely on her as well. So notice the evidence now. She's a midwife, besides running a place to eat and drink after hours. This point in the story is where Elijah lists out the various occupations that Mom Luby has. So she's a midwife, she's a lay preacher, she is a doctor, a herbal doctor. She does several things. And all of these things contribute to their income, their welfare. So this, these are the things, sorry, that contribute to their survival. And the idea now that develops the theme is that it shows that Mom Luby is enterprising. She's willing to work hard. So it ties in nicely with survival because if you're a survivor, then of course you're going to work towards surviving. 
Now, survival also comes out through the relationships. Mom Luby is very generous, and this generosity is to her own detriment at times. So notice that Elijah says, she wouldn't need welfare for us if people would just pay her sometimes. So she's very kind-hearted. So she will give of her services freely. She, of course, intended to be paid, but sometimes, you know, people are on short or they don't have the money at all. She's not going to deny them. So her relationships with others show that she helps others to survive as well. So she is integral in that regard. Now you look at how dialogue brings this out. So she has to make a plan to help provide for the children. And through the dialogue, she says children that day, and she goes and explains to them what she plans to do. So she tells them she's going to go down to the state office, the welfare office, to apply for the state aid. And notice the last part, the little warning there, don't mess up my lie because she's going to lie and say that these children are her children when they're not. So this shows how far she's willing to go to seek provision for the children, how far she's willing to go to ensure their survival. Now the plot conflict, the major issue in the plot is that she needs the state aid, well she wants it, and she wants it to help provide for them. But in the plot we discover that it's not forthcoming, based on what we said earlier. Miss Rushmore tells her all the hoops and whistles and things she has to jump through in order to get this money. And she decides, you know what? I'm going to be able to take care of them without it. So it's all right. We'll, we'll work it out somehow. So she and the children end up visiting the state office, the welfare office. But in the end, when she realizes that it's not going to happen, she assures them that they will get by somehow. And this shows just how resilient she is, how flexible she is. She can roll with the punches. So indeed, she is a survivor. Another element of the plot now, the key events. So you look at the fact that she applies for the aid, then you look at the social worker who visits, and then that visit is to determine if she qualifies at all. Now, the evidence we have is that she and the children go to the office and, of course, Miss Rushmore arrives at the house in order to investigate. Now, the ideas that develop the theme now, the fact that she's willing to seek help, for one, and when Miss Rushmore obstructs the help, she says, you know what, we'll get by without it. Somehow, God must provide. Now, the setting is integral to survival as well. So remember we said that she has a little room in the house that she operates her business from, her main business from, and it's called a speakeasy. So this is her main source of income. And notice that Elijah says a whole bunch of people was waiting for mom to let them into the speakeasy. She runs in the back of the room, in the back room. So most of the action occurs here. So the survival that is discussed, that is brought out throughout the story, a lot of it is centered around this one room, this special room. So it's her base of operations. A lot of her income comes from there. Remember, she feeds people. She provides them with corn liquor, which is somewhat illegal. And she pays a little thing to the police to keep it on the down low. But that is also part of the survival as well. She needs to keep her business running. So she needs to make sure that she's not arrested. She can't run it from prison and the children surely cannot run it on her behalf. So our next theme that we can look at in this story, love and family relationships, and that one should be fairly obvious. So through the characters, we look at Mom Luby and the fact that she realizes that she's not adequately providing for the children. And because she realizes this, she applies for the state aid. The evidence, of course, we mentioned before, she takes the children to the welfare office. And this now, what does it do? What does it show? Tell me. It shows that she loves these children. It shows that these children are as much a part of her as anyone else that she cares for. So it shows that she's a caring and loving person. Through relationships now, 
we'll see that Mom Luby has informally adopted these two children, Elijah and Arlethea. Well, you'll hear her referred to as Puddin during the whole story. And their mother has been dead for three years, so she has actually been taking care of them for three whole years on her own. And there is evidence. Elijah tells you how it is that they have come to be part of Mom Luby's family. And this relationship shows the depth of love she has to take on this kind of responsibility. Because as far as we know, she's not related to them. We're not sure who their mother is, but we're not told in the story that their mother is in any way related to Mom Luby. Of course, the dialogue brings out a lot of the, so the love and family relationships as well. So, of course, the idea, she's concerned about their welfare and her ability to provide for them. And this is what she says. I got to get some of the state aid so I can give you everything you need. That, of course, is a mother's love. She wants to give them the things that they need. And she says, never you mind, children. We'll make out fine like we always done. At this point is when she realizes the state aid isn't possible, so she reassures them. We didn't get the state aid, but guess what? We will still survive. So this shows that her maternal feelings and care for the children is genuine. Now we've been focusing on Mom Luby, but we also can focus on the fact that Elijah sees her as a parental figure. And he, throughout his narration, if you notice, he doesn't at any point make any negative statements towards her. He doesn't say anything bad about her. He doesn't say anything disrespectful to or about her either. So throughout his narration, he's very positive. He says all the good things about her. So although they're not closely related by blood, to the best of our knowledge, the children see her as a maternal figure. So the next thing we can look at is the plot conflict and how this brings out the whole theme of love and family relationships. And we know the conflict. The conflict is that Mom Luby is concerned about providing clothes and shoes for the children. The evidence, of course, several occasions she shares her concerns. So she says it a few times that she needs to get clothes and shoes for the children. And the idea that is developing the theme now is that she shows that she has their best interests at heart despite not being their birth mother. So that is how the whole idea of the love and the family relationship comes in because it is especially critical to know that she is not directly responsible for them. She has taken on this responsibility of her own free will. She chose to be responsible for them. So the key elements in the plot now that show this whole love and family relationship, the children don't reveal to Miss Rushmore when she comes there that Mom Luby is not their mother. So think about it, you know, Arlethea is five. The typical five-year-old, you cannot trust them to keep any secret. But Arlethea does. She doesn't speak. She doesn't say, but she's not my mother. No, neither her nor Elijah say anything. And Elijah is actually present in the room when Mom Luby is being interviewed, more or less, by Miss Rushmore, and he says nothing. So this now shows that the children actually do consider her to be their new mother. Remember, their mother has passed. She has more or less stepped into the role. So now we're going to switch our focus and look at thematic development in the day the world almost came to an end. A story as dramatic as its title. <laughs> so of course, the story. So our narrator is a 12 year old girl and she lives on a plantation in Louisiana. So it's Southern United States during the time of the Great Depression. So that would have been the mid early to mid 1930s. Now she has been raised in a very religious community. And from what we understand, she knows the whole concept of sin and salvation. So she has been taught good versus evil. And we know her father is an active member in the church, so that might have contributed to her knowledge of these things. So one Friday afternoon, she is told that the world is going to come to an end on Sunday. So remember, you know, today is Friday. So you minding your own business, watching a game, listening to music and somebody come and tell you the world is going to end 
two days from now, on Sunday, what would your reaction be, honestly? So the sign of this is the solar eclipse that is coming on Saturday. Solar eclipse meaning the sun will be in shadow. So the moon will somehow block the light of the sun, so the sun will seem dark. The skies will seem dark, depending on where you are in the world. Some people get darkness, some people just get a little overcast. But it's a solar eclipse. So she anxiously awaits the return of her father because she wants to question him if something really happened like that. He assures her that yes, the world is going to end one day, but the exact day and time, nobody knows for sure. And she really shouldn't be worrying her little head about it. Remember, she's just 12, you know. So she really shouldn't be worrying about it. But as a child of 12, confused, we can understand why she's worried. So in his explanation, he mentions that the world may not end for many, many years. Or it might end that very night. Which I'm sure in retrospect, he said, you know, I shouldn't have said that to her based on how she ends up reacting. Because at this point, instead of feeling better, she actually now starts to worry that the world might not end Sunday after all, but it might end that very night instead. So now, of course, if you're worrying that the world is going to end tonight, then are you going to sleep peacefully tonight? No. So instead of sleeping, she lies awake and she fret and she worry and she worry and she fret. And what happens now? She hears a plane approaching, but based on her setting, based on the time period that she grew up in, a plane is something she would never have seen or heard before. She knew of planes, but she never actually seen one or heard one. So when she hears this plane for the first time, and it is on the night that she is worrying that kingdom is coming, judgment, fire, brimstone, all that good stuff. You can just imagine how frightened she will be. So of course, she starts to panic. And in her panic, all her senses leave her. So she rushes out of the house in an attempt to outrun the danger, outrun the judgment. I don't know who tell her say I could outrun judgment on Armageddon Day, but she feel like she could do it. And she's in her nightgown, in the night, out in the road, running and screaming, the world is coming to an end, the world is coming to an end, Lord Jesus, help us all. Yes, that type of thing. Fortunately for her, she literally runs into her father. He's on his way from church with some other church members. He's with some deacons. So she literally runs right into him. And fortunately, he's able to stop her mad dash because who knows how far she would reach. And he tells her that it's just a plane. It's just a plane. It's not the world coming to an end. It's just a plane. And then you would think after this near-death experience, she would do what she was encouraged to do through the story and find religion and go give her life over to the Lord. No, she doesn't. She decides at this point, say, you know what? I'm going to fully embrace life. I'm going to enjoy everything that life has to give me. So let's look at the major themes. So of course, based on the summary, you know that religion plays a major part in this story. So we look at religion as it is brought out through character development. So we notice that in the beginning, the narrator is nonchalant. She doesn't really have a care or concern about religion at that point. She's aware of sin and sinfulness and the need to repent and find religion as they describe it. However, she believes that, you know, she has time, don't we all? We all believe we have time. However, after she gets the news, she begins to worry. So she gets very worrisome. And then... At the end, her mood changes again where she becomes joyful. So we see through her development, she changes as the story goes along. So story opens up with her narrating how unperturbed she is. So she explains, oh, yes, I know that we need to find religion and all of that because one day we have to go face judgment. But I don't need to do it now. I have a good 30 years. That's exactly what she says. A good 30 years before I need to do that. Don't know who told her that, but she had that in her mind, that she had 30 years of sin to commit. 
Then when she gets the news, of course, she starts to be worrisome. She starts to be fearful because she is faced with the imminence of her judgment. The judgment coming when? Sunday. And today is Friday. But after the scare and after her father reassures her, she gone back to square one with a little extra love on it. So she's not nonchalant. She's actually very glad, very overjoyed now that she won't be dying tonight. The world not ending yet. So stop worrying about it and just live life and enjoy life. So this now shows the effect that impending judgment can have on someone who is raised with an awareness of religious precepts. The fact that her mood changes when faced with the actual possibility of judgment. So dialogue, dialogue and internal monologue. Remember we said that these will bring out various aspects of a theme. So she has the consequences and they're told to her. She are told to her through her cousin and through her neighbor, Miss Dea. Now, her thoughts are that a Christian had to live upright and I knew it could, couldn't come up on account that there were so many things. Now, in her mind, she's saying that, yes, I'm supposed to live right. Yes, I'm supposed to do the right thing. But guess what? I don't need to do it right now. But then her cousin now brings in the whole idea that you better get some religion and you better hurry. And also her neighbor comes in and says, you better pray to the Lord because it's praying time. So these are the things that happened that Friday afternoon that caused her a little shift in her thoughts about being religious and her thoughts about getting religion. Now, of course, the ideas develop in the sense that the many thoughts about sin and sin and the consequences of sin, sinfulness and so on, and the whole idea that in the end, you are going to have to pay, these bring out religion. All right, so now, plot conflict. So the narrator is worried about the ending of the world before she has found religion. And of course she would worry because as we established already, she knows about sin, she knows about sinfulness, but is she living the right and true way? No, she's not. So she now, Faced with it, has to be worried, of course. Now, she hears the news from Rena, her cousin, and she hears the news from Miss Dea. So both of them come and tell her basically the same news within minutes of each other. So at this point, she starts to fret, of course, and start to wonder, something really goes off it true? So what she decides to do, she's going to wait on her father, and her father now, she's hoping, is going to come and reassure her that all is well. Now, this actually highlights the fact that she's aware of her own sinfulness. She's well aware. She know. And she's likely to be punished for them because she know. So the key events in the plot know that contribute to the whole idea of religion. So although she wants to seem indifferent, she wants to seem like she don't really care. She does care. She cares very much. And we saw that happening in the night. She cares a lot about it. So she lies awake thinking about the world ending. She runs screaming when she thinks that the sound of the plane is actually the sound of the, I guess, the heavenly host coming down to collect her. Not sure what she thought it was, but she runs screaming to try and get away from that sound. So how this develops the idea now? The indecision she has and her reaction to the plane, they show that religious beliefs taught are very much at the forefront. So even though she was pretending as if she never cared, she cares and she understands. Now, of course, the setting plays an integral part in bringing out this theme because the nature of the setting 
added to the whole suspense. It added to the whole wrapping up of her mind. It added to just about everything that happened to her on that particular day. And remember, we say setting takes in time, place, mood, atmosphere, all of that. So if you think of the time and the place, that especially will impact on how she reacts. So we look at the mood and the atmosphere, the nature of the society she lives in. It's very religious. So you did hear several people in the story telling her to go find religion and all of that. Her father is a member of the church. She mentions herself that she's from a church-going community. So everybody there, more or less, is religious. So that is going to play a big part. So even though she, sound, she seems serene when she first heard the news, eventually we know that that serenity shall be out the door. She's going to start to worry. Now, how does this contribute? So because of the religious nature of the society, she can't ignore the possibility that the world may be ending. So if it were a case where she lived in a less religiously structured setting, then if somebody came and told her the world going to end, she might just pass it off and say, ah, nothing like that. But because of the nature of where she has grown up, the type of people she has grown up with, she can't just pass it off as just hearsay. She has to take it seriously. So the time period now also contributes to the overreaction that she has when she hears the plane. Nowadays, we all have seen or heard a plane if even on TV. So we hear a loud noise outside. We won't necessarily think the first thing that, yes, gotta come. But in her society, at that particular time, a plane was something she had never heard. She had heard of planes, but she had never heard a plane. So hearing a plane for the first time on that night. So she would indeed have to be reacting the way she did. All right, so we need to also look at symbolism. So look at the idea that the solar eclipse was a symbol to them of the world coming to an end. So the idea here is that a natural occurrence can be viewed as an omen. And we know that it's usually viewed that way by people who are superstitious or people who are very religious. So we can't discredit it. So her cousin and her neighbor both come to her with the same belief that because the solar eclipse is approaching, then the end of the world is also approaching. And of course now, the idea that is being developed is the fact that by exaggerating the significance of this natural occurrence. We in modern society know that it's a natural occurrence. It happens every so often. But for their society, it's not so commonplace or it's something that they don't know so much about. And in their society, it's symbolic of something bad that's about to happen. So the writer's highlighting that misguided religion might be detrimental at times, as we see here. So we also have to look at love and family relationships in the story because we've already hinted at it. There's a good family relationship between the narrator and her father. So her father is portrayed as being understanding, caring, and of course, patient. So he's patiently, he patiently answers her questions about the world ending. So when she comes to him, Daddy, the world really are going to end tonight? He's there to talk to her and explain to her that it will end one day, but not necessarily today, even though he does go and plant the seed in our mind that it might end that very night, but we can forgive him for that. He was just trying to prove a point. Unfortunately, he didn't realize how his daughter would take it. So after she goes on her mad run and he catches her, he's the one who also soothes her and calms her down and reassures her that everything is all right. So we see that those qualities coming out in him. And the idea that can be developed through those things are that the father is very protective. So the father is to be a protector and he's supposed to also be a guide. So he's guiding her along in understanding what is going on in the world. And he's protecting her in this instance from herself and her own mind. So, of course, relationships factor in as well. 
And you realize throughout the story that she holds her father in very high esteem and high regard. She waits for him to explain to her what was really going to happen. And that night while she's in bed, she's actually waiting for her father to come home as well. So her father is like her little hero. So she doesn't believe the news when she first hears it. She waits on him to confirm that something really goes off with you. And she's very anxious to talk to him. And she's waiting all day, dying for him to come home to explain this thing to her and let her know that is something really goes off with you or a lie they might tell. So this also develops the whole idea of fathers being guides and protectors. So if you look at the dialogue and the internal monologue and the thoughts, of course, she relies on her father for reassurance. Throughout the story, you heard her thoughts explaining how much she wanted to speak to him, how anxious she was to have him come home. So it is him, or he I should say, it is he who allays her fears. He's the one who reassures her that she, he will be all right. Nothing bad going to happen to you tonight. And of course, this shows that her confidence in her father shows the level of trust she has in him. So now we're going to look at blackout and the thematic development in blackout. So we have to summarize it quickly, of course. So there's a nationwide blackout and a white American woman is standing at a bus stop and she's approached by a black native. She's confident for some reason that nothing can happen to her because she's white. Nothing bad can happen to her. There's nothing that they can do. And he ends up requesting a cigarette from her, a light, sorry, for his cigarette from her. And she's a little bit reserved at first, but then she gives in. After this, though, she throws her cigarette away. And this is where it gets sticky now because he's surprised at this action. He doesn't understand why she has done it. And then this leads to them having a little exchange. And in that exchange, some things are said that are not so complimentary. But then after her, after that, her bus arrives and she goes. And even though this man was so prideful and all in his ego initially, after she leaves, what does he do? He goes and picks up the cigarette that she had thrown away. So here are our major themes. So, of course, we look at how the themes come out through character. The major theme here, race. So we have this American female who is white and she has this pronounced sense of pride and self-righteousness. If you think to the, your other texts in literature, you can compare this in your mind, not on the paper, please. In your mind, you can call to mind Tesma Sabina Park. We had a similar situation there where someone white was outside of their country, but feeling that their whiteness gave them this sense of belonging, sense of superiority. So it's a similar situation here. So she's waiting at the bus stop, not the least bit nervous. Remember, you know, there are no lights. There is a blackout, a literal blackout, as well as a metaphorical blackout going on. And notice she says in her mind that she's American and fully conscious of the tradition of American young women that they don't scare easily bad woman so the idea and how it's developed she looks upon the black man as her racial inferior unfortunately and believes that he cannot dare to harm her and this sense of superiority of course is going to lead her to be surprised when he lights his cigarette from her hand instead of taking the cigarette and lighting it because she was saying how obscene it was that he bowed down to light from her cigarette when she was actually just passing it to him to use. So the relationship issues that come up now. So unlike the American, the man came up there and he did not see any difference between him and her other than what we will discuss later on, which is their gender. Now he easily approaches her and he even asks for a light. And for him, it's no big deal. But for her, unfortunately, it is. So his behavior actually highlights the irony in her behavior because she is an outsider and not him. So if anybody should be surprised at anybody, it should be him surprised at her. So of course, the dialogue brings out a lot of the racial issues as well. 
So each of them views their, their race in relation to the other's race differently. So he sees his blackness in relation to her whiteness, totally different from how she sees her whiteness in relation to his blackness. She sees herself as superior. He doesn't see her as his superior. So he doesn't find it unusual or out of place to ask her for a light. So the idea comes out in the fact that the race and the racial issues are viewed differently by each one. So the plot. White American believes that she is superior. Black man, not so much. So she ends up throwing away her cigarette after he uses it. And it is her action that highlights the racial issues that are seemingly non-existent to him. And the setting, of course, remember, it's in a Caribbean nation. We're not really told which one, but we know it's a Caribbean nation. So we expect it to be predominantly black. So it doesn't exist where they are. It only exists because she makes it be an issue. It's because of her that the racism actually exists. So the natives on the island don't see a problem with black versus white. She's the one who brings this up. And she's the only one that believes that her race sets her apart or above the native man. Then we also have gender. The issue of gender comes out. And it comes out in response to the racism. So these two issues are very closely linked. She brings up the issue of race, so he brings up the issue of gender. And he says, hello, miss, you're a woman, so therefore you should not be feeling superior because I'm a man. And because I'm a man, I'm the boss. And we know how men can get with their ego sometime. So a quick look at how dialogue does this. And the setting as well. Remember we said Caribbean island, black versus white. All right. So that's all the time we have for today's lesson. If you have any questions, send them in to the Ministry of Education and Television Jamaica social media pages. I'm Vanessa Francis. Up next, we have Cape Sociology. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
are back with more in Cape of Sociology. My name is Georgia Crawford Williams, and we will be looking at culture today. Actually, we're looking at family. We're starting with culture, because you know we have to revise, but we're going to be looking at family as our second topic. Now, you all know, I say to you every single solitary week, that if it is that you're going to be successful at this exam, you need to have a syllabus. You need to know where the various topics fall within your syllabus. Last week, we looked at culture, which is one of the main topics for module one, right? So that's module one, you have three modules. And now we're going into family, which is a major topic for module two. The topics of module one include culture. It also includes the perspectives, which we did before, the functionalists, the Marxists, we look at the interactionists, we look at the feminists. It also includes methodology, which is the last topic I normally do. But you guys would have started it a little bit because you're looking at your IAs, your internal assessments. But for module two, it looks at family, it looks at education, it looks at religion. Three big topics, the key institutions within society. And so today, Today we're going to look at family. But before I do, I should ask a question. Who gave you the definition of culture? I'm going to get into family, you know, but tell me, think about it. Who gave you the definition of culture? Because when it is that we get here each week, we shouldn't be replacing knowledge. We should be building, yeah? So if it is that I'm going to start family, it's because you should be comfortable with culture. You should feel like you know it. You should understand the key terms. So you should know counterculture and subculture, etc. So that when it is that I get into family now, you're building on the foundation of culture. Are you with me? Good? All right. So if you don't get Ralph Linton name yet, we have a problem. If when it was that I said, you know, counterculture, you scratch your head, we have a problem. If I say plantation society, you know, pick it up, we have a problem. It means you're not ready for family because you don't know culture. Are you with me? All right, but still we progress, we're going to get into family. Now, every topic that you start, you must have a definition. The definition for family was given to us by George Peter Murdoch. George Peter Murdoch is a functionalist, and he's a key functionalist as it relates to family. Now, there are many definitions of family. The one that is most popular is the one given by George Peter Murdoch. And Murdoch says, the family is a social group characterized by common residence, economic cooperation, and reproduction. It includes adults of both sexes, at least two of whom maintain a socially approved sexual relationship and one or more children owned or adopted by the sexually cohabiting adults. It's so enough, like, yo, that is so much, yeah? But you have to know it. Let me go again. I want you to know it verbatim. I want you to get into an essay, you know, when it is that you get into your exams and you can write down the definition and look bright. I tell you all the time, when you get into an exam, it's not about being bright. It's about convincing the examiner so you're bright, so you have knowledge. And to do that, you want to know your definitions. So once again, when it is that Murdoch defines the family, Murdoch says the family is a social group characterized by common residence. So you must pick, so you must live together, yeah? So if characterized by common residence, it's characterized by what else? Economic cooperation. It is characterized by reproduction. He says it should include adults of both sexes. Yes, you must have men and you must have women, right? At least two of whom, at least two of whom maintain, and that's very important, a socially approved sexual relationship and one or more children owned or adopted by the sexually cohabiting adults. Now, Murdoch says that this is the definition of the family. When it is that you look at it, you see that Murdoch is defining really the nuclear family. He's saying that the family, the only real family really, is the nuclear family. Now, since Murdoch has put forward this definition, there are many persons who have come up with other definitions, more generic definition that will take into account the different family forms that exist. We will go to them as we continue. But as we are going to start with the functionalist view, we're going to keep this as our base definition, and it is indeed the base definition of family used by many sociologists as they move forward. Good? All right, so that's Murdoch's definition. So let's go into Murdoch's theory. George Peter Murdoch spoke about the family and he gave us what is called the four functions of the family. Now Murdoch says, listen, 
Families have four major functions. The families have a socialization or an educational function. The families have an economic function. The family has a reproductive function and it has a sexual function. Right? He says that the functions of the family, they function not only for the individuals within the family, but they function for society on the whole. And that is why the family is the cornerstone of society. So, for instance, the family has a socialization function. It is the family that teaches you right from wrong. Now, this is very important, you know, because if you as an individual don't know right from wrong, the result or the consequence is that you're going to be an outcast in society. So when the family functions by socializing you, it benefits you, the individual. Now, also, when the family socializes you, it benefits the society because it ensures that the, the society has what is called a value consensus. Now, if you don't know the term value consensus, we have a problem, you know, because you can't reach a family and you don't know value consensus. We would have explained the value consensus when we spoke about Durkheim. And the value consensus is an agreement on what is right and what is wrong. So if there is no value consensus, the result is that there is chaos in society. And so when the family socializes you, it ensures that society is stable by ensuring that there is a value consensus, an agreement on what is right and what is wrong. So the socialization function functions for you, the individual within the family, but it also functions for the family in the society in general. Good. The second key function of the family given to us by George Peter Murdoch is that the family has an economic function. And the economic function functions for you, the individual, but it also functions for the society in general. What we mean by that? The family's economic function ensures that you are looked after. Him say it is because you have families around you, family members where you can eat. The parents ensure you go to school and you are looked after. But even for the parents, there is an economic function because the mother and the father can come together and them can pool them resources. Yeah? So if the father really not have none today, the mother can back him up. If the mother not have none today, the father can back her up. So as husband and wife, the family has an economic function to look after each other. As children, the family has an economic function. So you find that even if the man is said to be the protector and the provider, hmm, if one day when bilious, if one day him not have none, him can touch your wife and say, wifey, you know we stay, oh you stay. And you know wives always have something put on. She never have no money yet till it needed. Yeah, that sort of thing. And yes, she can push down in her some little pocket, you know, probably in the shirt somewhere. She can find a thing for back him up. That is the economic function. Now, the economic function is not only for the individuals within the family, but also for the society as well. Now, how does the family function economically for the society? If the family is not there to look after you, then the burden of looking after you goes to the state. That does not help the society at all. Because it means that now government have to go try to feed you, they have to go try to clothe you, they have to go look after you in general. And so when the family actually plays its economic function or provides the economic function, then it benefits the society. Good? Now, the family also has a reproductive function. It is because family members get together, mother and father, and have children that we have the society continuing, which is good for the society, but it's also good for you. Because if there is no reproduction, you wouldn't be here. So there is a reproductive function. The reproductive function is different from the sexual function. The family has a sexual function. And Murdoch says that sex within the family, between the mother and the father, is imperative for the individuals within the family and for the society in general. When the sexual function is done well, then the mother and the father are happy. Yeah, because sex brings about joy and happiness, which is wonderful for the mother and the father, but it's wonderful for the children as well. Because when your mother and your father are happy, then you are happy as well. Yeah, it is also good for society because happy people in a family lead to happy people in the society. So there's less conflict because the man feel good. There's less conflict because the woman no vex. Yeah, and you all know that. Yeah, you all speak about that in your own terms all the time. Yeah, because if the teacher come to school one day happy, yeah, say, yes, miss, get a boyfriend. That's the same sort of thinking that is coming from Murdoch's sexual function.
So Murdoch says the family has four key functions, and you must know the four. You need it for essay purposes, you need it for multiple choice purposes. The four functions, educational or socialization, the second one, economic function. The third function is a reproductive function. And the fourth function is a sexual function. Now, it is important to note. Let me just, yes, all right, hold on. Ah, Murdoch believes that it is only the nuclear family that can provide all the functions that he just mentioned. And so he says that the nuclear family is the only universal and functional family. He says all other family units can't provide the four functions and therefore they're not families. They're either broken down versions or extended versions of the real family, but they're not functional enough to be seen as a family. That's very, very, very critical. Because a multiple choice question will ask you which family according to the functionalist is universal and it's the nuclear family. Murdoch says extended family and a proper family. It can't function properly. It does not socialize you well because you have all kind of people and give all kind of different views. So mommy say A and daddy say A, but then granny will live there say C and then your auntie say D and so there is conflict and confusion and improper socialization. He says a single parent family is the worst family. It's no family at all. It's just a broken down unit. There's no economic cooperation. So it is always very poor. One person and one hand can't clap. Yeah? You find that there is no continuous reproduction. And if so, it is reproduction where you move on from one person to the next, which is not functional. No proper socialization because one person is missing. So if it is a single parent in terms of only a mother, then there is no father. And there, there is need for a father to properly socialize, whether you're a boy or a girl. If it is that you're a young man, you need a man around to show you how to be a man, according to Murdoch. He said, no matter how good your mother be, no matter our best intentions, if you're going to be a man, you need a man to show you how to be a man. And so if the family has no male, then it's a problem. And if you're a female as well, you need a father. You need to understand how to relate to men and to see your mother relating to men, that sort of thing. And so if that is missing, then you're not properly socialized. So for reasons like these, Murdoch makes the big point that the only real family, the only functional family that exists is the nuclear family. And he says because of its functionality, because it is, you know, so good within the society, it has become the universal family. It is found everywhere. Good? Now I can't stress enough how important that point is because as it relates to your exams, because remember we are here for the knowledge but we are also preparing for exams. As it relates to your exams, the functionality of the family is a key question. Even for those who are in unit two and you get to crime, the functionality or dysfunctionality of the family and how it leads to crime and other consequences, key. How it impacts education, how it impacts religion, key and so you must first have a basic understanding of how the family functions one and then if it is not functional what are the consequences why are some family types not seen as functional yeah because it's not about just gaining the knowledge it is also the use of knowledge you understand me good all right, so we look at George Peter Murdoch, and he is our first functionalist. And we're looking at another now, Talcott Parsons. And Talcott Parsons gave us the theory called the functional fit theory. Now, Talcott Parsons, like Murdoch, functionalist, and so he believes that the best family is the nuclear family. He make it clear. In the nuclear family's best fit modern industrial societies. Now, what's a modern industrial society? The society that we live in now, they are modern industrial societies. So you had traditional societies that were pre-industrial, and now you have modern societies, which are the sort of capitalist societies that we live in, that came after industrialization. Now, Talcott Parsons says, if you should look at the family, the nuclear family, you will find that it is the best family for a modern industrial society because of what it offers. So first and foremost, the nuclear family offers what is called geographic mobility. 
it is easy to move the nuclear family from one place to the next. Now that is important, you know, because in an industrial society, you need to be able to move easily to find work. So if work not the right here, so you have to move to where the factory is, go get work. And so it is best to actually have a nuclear family that allows for geographic mobility. Good? So that is very, very important. Good? Now also, the nuclear family best fits because the nuclear family ensures that there is less likely to have conflict. Not just conflict, but class conflict. According to Talcott Parsons, in an extended family, you have adults living with their parents. So you have adult children living with adult parents. In the traditional society, before industrialization, that was fine. Because before industrialization, everybody in society have what we only call ascribed status. Now what I mean by ascribed status? You only have the status where you're born with. Yeah? So from your good year, the father is the father. You must ascribe status mean that he's superior because he's the father. And the child, whether you're 25 or you're 50 or you're 12, you're still the child. And so your ascribed status means that your status is lower than that of your father. Simple. That was how it was in the traditional society. But with industrial societies, they have introduced now what is called achieved status. Status that you earn. So you have the ascribed status where you're born with, so you're the daughter. And then you have the achieved status where you earn, which means that you're a doctor, or you're a teacher, or you're a university student, that sort of thing. Now he says, if it is that we live in an extended family, in an industrial society, you're always going to have the clash of the ascribed status and the achieved status. Because the adult child who will have the lower ascribed status because she's the child, may have a higher achieved status because she is a lawyer and her father might be a garbage man. And so when it comes to now decisions in the family, the child is saying that as the lawyer, I believe my achieved status is higher and so I will make the decisions. And the father is saying, but I am the father. And as the father, my ascribed status is always higher, so I will make the decision. Yeah? So if it is that so the family have a problem, yeah? so they can't pay some bills, the father might come up and say, all right, I have a plan. Yeah, we can't pay our bills and things now work good. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to burn down the house and get the insurance. Yeah, come, we do it. So everybody take out on the things and make we run out quick because of that our plan. Now he's the father. He have the higher ascribed status. So he come and he make a decision. Yeah? Now the daughter, who has the achieved status as a lawyer, she's like a daddy, daddy, daddy. I'm here to say to you that that plan is not only ridiculous, it is illegal. And so we will not be doing that. But the father look on her, but I wear this girl now. You know, because I'm the father. So how you as the daughter come tell me now, what go go on in a my house? It can't work. I'm here the father. And she has said, but I am the lawyer. And so this is my area. And I know. And so there is a clash. They say that when you live in a nuclear family, the child, when they reach 20, 25, them left, go start them own nuclear family. So there is no clash of achieved and ascribed status because the adults, the father, will automatically have the higher ascribed status. And because these children are young, they don't have no achieved status, so there is no clash. So for Talcott Parsons, the nuclear family best fit industrial societies. He also says that the extended families are obsolete. There is no longer any need for them. There was a time when we needed the extended families because we never have no specialized institutions. Yeah? We never have no hospitals. So you didn't need your auntie when you know about all of the bush them. And so are your granny when you know about the bush them. So you go to she. But now you don't really need her to live with you because if you're sick, you can go to the hospital. You did need one auntie because she one could have read good. So she had to teach everybody how to read. But you don't need her again. Because what? Well, you have schools. So I'm saying you find that the extended family in traditional societies was very important. But you see now, not so much. They are obsolete. Good? And so it is best to live in a nuclear family. Right? Now, that being said, he goes on to say that the nuclear families have two major functions. One is primary socialization. Primary socialization means it teaches you right from wrong. 
According to Talcott Parsons, the family is so important as socializing agent that it is where your identity is formed. You are who you are because of the family that you grew up in. So the majority of you going to grow up to become your parents, going to grow up to become your mother or your father. As a matter of fact, if most of you are already your mother or your father, the things them where you say, similar to what your mother or your father say. When it is that I am, you know, interacting with my children, I always start as me. Yeah, I start as Georgia, like, um, why are you doing that? You know, that's how I start. Yeah. Don't explain what is wrong. What is it that is happening here? But after the next two minutes, I become my mother. Hey, what not? Not chicken, Mary. Ah, then here. No, no, stay right there, so. If you're back, right there, so. Yeah? Because automatically, the same parental styles come out because the family is where your identity is formed. Who you are is based on primary socialization in the family. So it is very, very critical. But he says another function of the family that is often ignored is the fact that the family stabilizes the adult personality. According to Talcott Parsons, the family is your refuge. The family is the only place that you get to be yourself. Everywhere else, when you go out, you are pretending. But when you reach home, you get a chance to be you. You get a chance to relax, yeah? If it is that you are home, you can act in the manner that you want to act and nobody quarrel. When you're out of road, you have to be somebody else. And so the family helps to stabilize the adult because it gets a place to go and unwind and be themselves. For example, you spend the majority of your time at school or even at work. And yet, if it is that you should go to the bathroom and you should want to defecate, you know, say so, you know. You know, the bathroom, I pretend like you're doing something else. No, it's a natural bodily function, yeah? But you pretend, yeah, look, if nobody there, they'll catch you, I see, yeah? Somebody come in the bathroom and say, mm-mm, no, what that, you're going like, you know, hear nothing. You know, come out till you see the, the coast clear. That's all I think. If you should ever need tissue, you would never shout out and beg a tissue. Because you're like, oh, no, I am not. I do not do those things. But at home, you're in the bathroom, you need a tissue, you call, you shout. Somebody can send a tissue, come. Please, that sort of thing, yeah? You actually get up and say, I'm going to go, and nobody do have a problem. Because it's the only place you can be yourself. You go, your clothes tear up. Nobody na ask no question, yeah? You know, be it from yesterday. And nobody na say, no man, yeah? But if somebody should ever come out at work and ask if you're bathing, of course, I bathe this morning and I bathe in later on, that sort of thing. But if your mother asks your sister, ask her, tell me not bathe from yesterday, I mean, I bathe till tomorrow. Because at home, you can be yourself. Talcott Parsons says the family stabilizes the adult personality because it acts as a place of refuge, the only place you can be your authentic self. Additionally, the family has children and the children bring joy to the adults. They said children help to stabilize the adult personality because parents get a chance to live vicariously through their children. And so all the things that they didn't get to achieve, them get a chance to achieve it when they have children. All the things that they didn't get to do, they get a chance to do it now because they have children. I can tell you, when I went to primary school, I went to Halfway Tree Primary School, which is a wonderful primary school, and they had one of the best dance troops. And I always wanted to dance. I thought I could dance, as a matter of fact. You know, when I was growing up in my community, I was called Gigi Weiner. So I was like, you know, I am the best dancer. And I went to try out for dancing, and I'll never forget Miss Burke. I go in there and I go in and I put on my clothes and I'm doing everything. And Miss Burke said, Come, you, 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 come out on the car dance. And when I say, I heard to my core in a man, I go home, go explain to my mother, my big, and my mother say, oh, she look like a can't dance. Yeah, that sort of thing. And it hurt me. So you see, when it was that I had my first child, and she started go to school, the first thing she signed up in a, a dancing. First thing she signed up in a, a dance. Whether she didn't want to dance or not, I don't care, but she had to dance, because me always did want to be on stage. Always wanted to be on stage, yeah? And so automatically, she had to dance. I make sure when you see her upon the stage, I dance, me understand where teacher said, well, me couldn't dance because she can't dance neither. Yeah, everybody I go left, she I go right. Me not care, me take a million pictures like she have special part. Click, yeah? And it gave me lots and lots of joy. She always the way around at the back because she really can't dance. But me pay for dancing, so she have to dip on the stage because it brought me joy.
According to Talcott Parsons, the family helps to stabilize the adult personality because it allows the parents now to live vicariously through the children. Talcott Parsons said many of families stay together just because of the children. You get something for talk about, yeah? Guess what your daughter do today? You have conversations. So Talcott Parsons agrees with Murdoch that the best family is nuclear. Yeah, first and foremost. He believes that the only family that fits an industrial society is nuclear. But he also says that the family has two basic functions. One, primary socialization, and two, stabilization of the adult personality. He says those adults that don't have a family as a refuge, they are the ones that experience far more stress and are less likely to function properly in society. Those that have a family to go home to, they are the ones that are more than likely going to be functional. So you see, for the functionalists in general, the families that are functional are totally nuclear and for different reasons, yeah? They believe that all the other units now work. Good? All right. Of course, they have to be criticized. We start with Edmund Leach. Leach spelled L-E-A-C-H. And we always say him of the Leach's theory. Now don't go in your exam and write same of the Leach's theory. That is not what the theory is called. But because of what the theory says, we call it the leech's theory. Leech the animal, you know of a leech? That's, you know, suck on tea and suck blood and live off you as a parasitic animal? Leech theory is similar to that, right? So leech says that the nuclear family is definitely not the best family. Leach says that nuclear families are too small to provide the love and support that the family members need. And so they aren't functional at all at all. He totally disagrees with what the functionalists say. He said, listen, it is true, as Parson says, that the family is a place of refuge. The family is a place that you go to look love and support. Yeah? However, when you live in a nuclear unit, there are too few members to give you the love and support you need. And so when it is that the mother comes home and she has an issue, she's running in to talk to her husband. You know, she's like, guess what happened today? But the husband, him have an issue that he want to talk to she about as well. Yeah, and then the children come and they have issues and they want to talk. But there is not enough members to show the support and to actually listen to everything that everybody has to say. And the result is that parents fight and children rebel because you just don't have the time. Leach said, first and foremost, there are certain things that as a husband, you can't talk to your wife about. It's as simple as that. There are certain things that your wife just don't understand. So if you're a husband, for instance, and you went to work, and there is a new secretary, and you just can't stop thinking about how the lady breast big. Yeah. It's just a, it, you just like how she look. There is no way you can go home and say it to your wife. Hey, suppose you see the new secretary, oh, she's nice. Yeah, no matter how nice your wife is. You know, she might say yes now, but you see tomorrow, if you're five minutes late, all of us are where you're there. You want the secretary, mm -hmm. and so it becomes an issue. Yeah, because according to Leach, and this is Leach's view, she does not understand how the male mind work. And that is why you need an additional family member, like a brother or an uncle, where you can go and you can say to him. And as a man to man, he can understand and he can discuss and he must say, yeah, yeah, man, she shape right. Yeah, man, freezer, ice, yeah. And you can have a full discussion, yeah. And then afterwards, he can say to you, say, well, all right, then. But look, but not touching on coming by a married man. Yeah, man, as a matter of fact, give me your number, make me call her. Yeah, that sort of thing. And we can move on. Them say, the woman don't really understand that. And so him don't get the support he need. Similarly, as wives, there are certain things that your husband don't care about. You go home to him and you explain, and him is like, all right, why? I remember once I had a conflict at work. And I went home, it's like, you know, what it is, I was younger at the time as well. And so this girl at work was my arch nemesis as far as I'm concerned in our own little world. She not like me, and me not like she. Simple. And I remember one day she came and she said something that was bad as far as I'm concerned. I'm a vex, my vex, my vex, my vex. May I drive home, my vex, my vex, my vex. We reach home, my vex, my vex, my vex. And as we reach, my husband is watching the news. I'm going to stop the news. I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him. And he said, So that's it? All right, she'll lead. You there, she the one, and you the zero. All right, let me watch the news. And that's all he had to offer. And I said, What? 
And I was so upset with you when I called my sister to say, guess what happened? And guess what day? And eh, hey, when I don't talk to my sister, my sister says, she said, what? All right, well, we're going to find her. Tell me where she lives, you know? And that was what I needed so that we could have that sort of discussion so we could feel that somebody understand where I'm coming from. Leach says it is best to live with an extended family so that each family member can get what it is that they need, the support and love. So now I have a sister so the sister can understand where I'm coming from with my little petty rubbish that I am cussing about. My husband don't care, he might watch news. Yeah, the ball is cool. Me want to know what happened at the sports. Yeah? So him now get a chance to just be the man and I can get a woman to share the same sort of burdens with. And so Lee says, even the children, Lee says grandparents are very important for the children because the grandparents they always have time for them, will listen, will give them the love and support. And so for Leach, the nuclear family is far too small. It is the extended family that is better because there are additional members to give the love and support that the people need. R.D. Leng agrees. R.D. Leng says that the nuclear family is dysfunctional. Instead, the nuclear family, like Leach, offers far too little support. Him said, listen, man, you see the nuclear family? It's like a nexus. It's a little group where everybody in there fight for love and support. And that is why you find that children have sibling rivalry, because you always want to make sure you get all the attention and love from your parents, yeah? So there is sibling rivalry because you have fight for the little love when they never go around. And the continuous fighting for the love will lead to continuous conflict within the family. And this continuous conflict is internalized and it can send you mad. Lee Leng says to us that the thing that impacts you the most in life is your family. Something happened at the morning, somebody drink out your juice out of the fridge, and all two o'clock a day, you're cussed about who drink out your juice in the fridge. So, he said, conflict in the family is the worst sort of family. And when it is you live in a nuclear family, the conflict is constant because you always have to fight for the love. He said, especially children, they're always fighting each other to get the parental love. So, when I was growing up, and if I had a year that I didn't do well in school, which Unfortunately, it was more, was often, yeah? <laughs> so I might have a bad report. And my, and my bad report, you know, because I was a scholarship student, so my bad report at 70, yeah? So if I have a bad report at 70 or 60, I wait till my brother report come, you know? Because if my bad report at 60, my brother bad report I'll average all 13. So when I give my mother, she start cussing, I say, you know, I do not work. I say, yeah, look, bad day, man, what? From me, say that, you know, bad. I dare me, I time to get cussed, because fee moon worse. And so automatically, me look better. You follow what I've seen? Yeah? And of course, because of that, my brother always a me, always a tug of war. I used to have very bad acne, and he would sing songs. My mother have a greater, chick, chick, chick. It is George F. Hayes, chick, chick, chick. And me used to vex, and we used to fight. Yeah? My little sister was like that as well. She always wanted to be seen as the good, bright one. So she fight for the love. My father used to do thing when he said, come with play spelling B. I have to know I don't understand how that's a game. Come with play spelling B. And I remember one time, my father come in and said, spell salmon. Now my sister go, ah, then you know, man. Ah, then used to have the spelling B champion them, you know. She used to try out with Archer so she can't spell. So if the man come in and say, spell salmon, now she forget up. No, sir, she sit down. Everybody else sit down, no say nothing. My father point to me and say, you spell salmon. Me get up, me can't spell nothing at all. Me say S-A-M-O-N. The man say, you know, sir, high school, you go. Hmm? Me go give you a hint. One L in it. Hear me with for me down self. S-A-M-O-N-L. <laughs> the man get mad. The man say, me I spend my money, say, you go high school. No, my sister can't spell it, you know. She sit down. My father says, spell salmon. L in it, pick me the L silent. Me say, L S A M O N. <laughs> when the man get off, at that time for my sister get up. I can spell it, daddy. I can spell it. S A L M O N. And my father said, one hour no, I go come save me and mind me. The rest, how no, me don't know. You know, that's all the tea. And so automatically, she had a favorite. So you know, the night, the me girl will up a secret lick. Yeah? Because me, I said, look how you make me look bad. 
and you look good, yeah? According to Lang, this is a continuous part of nuclear families because there's not enough love to go around. And that is why it is dysfunctional. You need to have an extended family where if you don't get the love from daddy today, you can go to grandma. He speaks a lot about the importance of grandparents. Grandparents are a continuous source of love and support. The things that your parents don't understand, your grandparents understand. The things that when my picnic them get away with my mother yard, you know, I could never think about it, you know. I could never, me see all my kids down my mother house just a jump on our chair. Just a jump up on our sofa. If we didn't ever jump up on my mother's sofa, you know, get a chance to land, you know. Something like you for a long time, yeah? Them just jump, my mother's like, leave them. Let them live, <laughs> yeah? Them said that source of love, every child needs it. Because parents have to discipline you, but your grandparents can be the source of love and support you need. And so they too believe that it is best to live in an extended family rather than to live in a nuclear family. Now, it is important to note that there is one thing that the functionalists and the critics of the functionalists that we just spoke about agree on. I wonder if you're thinking about it. Remember, the functionalist said the nuclear family is best. Lee Chan Leng says rubbish, the nuclear family is dysfunctional. The extended family is best. It means, therefore, that both of them agree that the single parent family is the worst one. Because if the nuclear family is too small, according to Lee Chan Leng, then you can imagine the single parent family. Are you following what I'm saying? And remember, Murdoch them don't agree already that the nuclear family is best because you have mother and father. So if you have a question that speaks about the single parent family and its viability in Caribbean societies, it is important to note that these same theorists can also answer. The same theorists like Leng and Murdoch and Parsons, they can also answer that question because by saying that the nuclear family is best, they are saying that the single parent family is not viable. By saying that the extended family is best, they are saying that the single parent family is not viable. It's not just the knowledge, it's the use of knowledge and the analysis. So. That is all for us today. I hope you understood the points discussed. But if you need a revision, you can catch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN today at 4 p.m. And the highlights of the week's programs are also on Saturdays between 1 and 4 p.m. And of course, on video on demand on One Spot Media. We also have two channels to help with additional lessons developed and it's devoted to students of all ages. They are on One Spot Media. So check that out. I am Georgia Crawford Williams. And of course, remember, keep safe, wash your hands regularly, sanitize and wear your mask. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.